I want you to take just a moment and lift up a mighty praise of thanksgiving. Don't ever lose your thankfulness. Oh, God, we praise you. We praise you. Thank you, Jesus. I think, I think we ought to save our best praise for the Lord Jesus Christ. All of his goodness. Don't forget his benefits who forgives all of our iniquities and who cleanses and heals all of our diseases. One more time. Let's just do it because it's right. Let's just do it because he's worthy. Give him praise and give him thanks. Wonderful Jesus. Why don't you, why don't you before you're seated, just tell someone, I'm glad you're in church this morning. You look good. Welcome all of our campuses. Wherever you are viewing this, those of you on our online campus, those of you watching by television, we are so delighted always to have you with us. To God be the glory for all that he is doing. Y'all look good today. You look good. Did you enjoy at the movies? Did you enjoy that? Yeah, it's good. I did too. That's a brilliant invention. Amen. Just go in. I might do that. Just start taping my sermon during the week. And playing it on a video, and I'm going to go to the lake like a bunch of you heathens do. Amen. 1 <laughs> Kings chapter 13. Let's go. I, um, I want to talk to you today uh, from an Old Testament story. I, if you attend here or follow this ministry, you know that I love the Old Testament. And I believe that it always has parallel lessons under the new covenant that are profound and powerful. And I've been reading the book of 1 Kings uh, in, in my study time. And just, I like to take a book at a time and just kind of pour into it and think over it and pour through it. And this particular story caught my attention. And I want to share with you something that I pray God makes real today. 1 Kings chapter 13 and verse 28. Then he went and found his corpse thrown on the road and the donkey and the lion standing by the corpse. The lion had not eaten the corpse, nor torn the donkey. And the prophet took up the corpse of the man of God, laid it on the donkey, and brought it back, so that the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. Then he laid the corpse in his own tomb, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. So it was after he had buried him that he spoke to his son saying, when I am dead, then bury me in the tomb where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. And I want to talk to you today on one word and I pray that this story will come alive in your heart and will leave a lasting impression. That one word would be influence. I want to talk to you about influence. There was an evil king by the name of Jeroboam. And he turned from God and God's ways. And he began to worship idols and sacrifice to these false idol gods. And he was doing so in a place called Bethel which means in Hebrew, the house of God. He is transforming God's house into a place of idol worship. He's burning incense and offering blood sacrifices to demon gods in God's house. And the scripture said while he was doing it, there came a prophet. And I'm just going to sum up what was taking place and what I just read you. While this evil king was doing this and the whole nation and many of the people were watching him, do this abomination. There came a prophet from the Lord who walked through the gates of Bethel and began to prophesy against that king. That's bold. He knew that his life would be on the line, but God told him to do it, and he did it. And as he began to prophesy that that kingdom would not stand because of what he was doing, the abomination that he was doing, the scripture said that the king in anger and in a fit of rage, reached out to grab and lay hands on that prophet and do him harm. And when he did, when he reached his hand for that prophet, the Bible said that 
the king's hand withered. And when it withered, the king was so moved and so humiliated and humbled that he fell to his knees and he cried out for mercy in front of everybody. And the, the prophet prayed for him and instantly God restored his hand and healed him. And then the king turned to him and overwhelmed with gratitude and realizing the magnitude of the call of God upon this prophet. He said, come to the palace and eat dinner with me tonight and let me throw a banquet in your honor and in the honor of your God that, that sent you. And the prophet, showing the integrity of his heart, said back, I cannot, for the Lord has commanded me to not eat nor drink in this polluted land. And he said, I'm not interested in any of the fame and any of the fortune, any of the acclaim that you can give me. I came here with a message and God even told me not to go back the same way I came and he told me not to eat or drink nothing in this polluted land. The scripture said that he got on his donkey and he started to leave. And this would be an amazing story. I mean, I love stories like that in the Old Testament. Can you imagine that, that, that moment when that king was angry and started to reach for that prophet and grab him by the neck. And the, I think of that verse in Isaiah that said, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Suddenly that mighty hand of that king withered up like a, like a, like a leaf in, 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 in the autumn, fall weather. It just withers up and, and, and then the prophet prays and God restores. I want to have one Sunday like that before I die where... Where, where, where God just confirms something powerful. Don't you know that felt awesome? And this guy could handle it because he could handle it because when the king said to him, come back to my palace and let me make a big deal about you, he said, oh no, God told me not to eat or drink anything in this polluted land. I'm leaving and I'm not even going back the way I came. This would be such an awesome story if it ended there. But something happens on the tail end of this story that is remarkable, in the same land, there lived an old backslidden prophet who at one time had a great anointing upon his life, who at one time carried the same measure of prophetic words that God would back up with amazing and astonishing miracles. But somewhere along the way, the king bought his favor and enriched him with great wealth and he stopped prophesying the word of the Lord and the king paid him to prophesy only good things. And this old prophet who was just a shell of what he used to be, a man who at one time had a mighty anointing and call upon his life, but now something has happened to him. Something has happened to his gift and when the king is performing abominations, he's silent and he's home because he's been bought and paid for by the king. And he won't even use that prophetic gift, nor does it stir in his heart anymore. But when, 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 when that prophet is sitting at home, that old prophet, his boys come running home because they were there when that young prophet confronted the king. They saw the hand wither. They heard him refuse the invitation of the king to go to the palace. And they came running home and they said, Dad, Dad, you won't believe what happened today. The, the king was offering to demon idols sacrifices and that there came this young prophet. It's like the stories you used to tell us, Dad. It's like those services that you used to have. It's like those moves and miracles that God used to perform through you that you, in the good old days, that you talk about that we don't see anymore. Dad, it happened today. And that prophet, he, 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 he prophesied gloom and doom to the king and the king's hand withered when he tried to touch him and then he healed him. And the king was so moved. There was some spark of some flicker of, a, of an ancient flame that once was there. And suddenly something in him was so moved, so yearned to get in a move of God again. To feel the real presence and anointing of God again. That he said, I must, I must bring that young prophet to my house today. And so he went and got on his horse and he found the prophet as he was trying to exit the land 
And he said to him, come eat with me. The young prophet gave him the same answer. He said, I cannot. He said, I'm a prophet, and I've done many great, mighty miracles. We serve the same God. We have the same doctrine, and, and, and I believe in one God. And I'm telling you, you need to come eat with me. And he said, the Lord told me not to eat or drink in this polluted land. And then the old prophet did something terrible. The Bible said that he said to him, an angel appeared to me in my home and told me to come tell you to come to my home and eat a meal with me. And when he told him that, something happened to that young prophet. And he said, well, I guess if an angel told you that, and then the, ne the next part of the verse says, but he lied unto him. There was no angel. He made it up. And the young prophet said, well, if an angel told you, I guess if an angel told you, then it would be okay for me to go to your house and eat a meal with you. And that's exactly what he did. I thought of the verse where it said that if any man, Paul said, if any man comes preaching, even if an angel comes preaching another gospel than what I preached unto you, let him be accursed. Just because it looks spiritual and just because it sounds spiritual, if it's not in the book and it's not what thus saith the Lord, you don't follow that and you don't go with the influence of that. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of doctrines of demons now. And I'm not just talking about, I'm talking about anything goes and all religions and all of this stuff. And you, you can pick and choose whatever you want. That is not what this book teaches. Not everybody's going to heaven. And just because people are good people, it's not good enough to get you into heaven. There's only one way. There's only one truth. There's only one life. And it is Jesus. And this is his word. It's not Buddha. It's not new age. It's not other religions. It's not Islam. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And no man comes to the father, but by me, Jesus said, I am the way. Come on now. I am the truth. I am the life. And there's no other way. There's no other truth. And there is no other life that is eternal except in Jesus Christ. And the prophet goes home to the old prophet's house. And I could see in my mind, it's what I do is when I read these stories, I, put my, I, I pull my chair up to the table. And I could see them sitting around like preachers do. I know how preachers are, old preachers and young preachers. When we get together, they want to hear. They try to stir you up. They want to hear the stories. They want to tell me about that sermon. Tell me about preaching there. Tell me about this. Tell me about that. And I could just see that old prophet, that old shell of a prophet, that old man who at one time had a mighty anointing on his life, but something had happened and he had traded the preciousness of the anointing of the Holy Spirit for material things and now this young prophet is sitting there and they're exchanging stories. And I'm sure the old prophet told him about when I was young, I preached and God backed me up with a miracle and this happened and that happened. And they had a good time in that meal. And he begged him, he said, stay the night. And he said, I cannot. I must do what God told me to do and leave this polluted land. And he goes out, that young prophet, and gets on his donkey and goes down the road, and no sooner does he get down the road, there is a lion that attacks him and kills him. And someone comes to the door of the old prophet and says, there's been an accident, something terrible has happened. And that prophet today that impacted and, and touched the king and the kingdom, he's dead in the streets. And the old prophet got on his donkey and rode down there, and when he got there, all he saw was the lion standing there, staring. And the man, the man's corpse laying in the street with his blood spilled. And the donkey that had not been assaulted by the lion is just standing there. And the man begins to weep. And he picks the corpse up and brings it back home on the back of his donkey. And he buries him in his own plot, in his own tomb. Over his own tombstone, he puts him in that place, this young prophet, and he weeps and he cries and he is moved because it dawns on him 
what he has done. He begins to weep because he realizes that it was my influence. This was a good, godly young man who had the anointing on his life, but I used my influence in an evil way to destroy his life. When he finally buried him, the old prophet turned to his boys and he makes one of the strangest requests in all of the Bible. He says to his sons after he's buried the young preacher that he influenced to go against the word of the Lord and to do what God told him not to do. His influence was what caused that man's ministry to be cut off early and now he's in a grave. And he turns to his boys and he says, when I die, promise me this. Promise me that you will bury my bones in the same grave with his bones. For if it wasn't for me, he would still be preaching. If it wasn't for me, he would still be anointed and powerful. If it wasn't for me, he would not be in the grave. He would be pro profoundly changing the atmosphere and culture of this nation. And he said, bury me in the same grave. In other words, I want to preach on the power of influence. The personal influence one individual can have on another for good or for evil. When Adam was in the garden, the Bible said he was alone and God said it's not good for him to be alone. Why? Because no one can have influence if they're by themselves. And as soon as he gave him Eve, then suddenly influence was birthed and began on the earth. Influence is such a powerful thing. Your influence matters. Influence is so powerful that the Apostle Paul put it like this. No man lives unto himself and no man will die unto himself. In other words, when you die, the same place that your bones are laid, that spiritually is going to have an influence on your children, on people that know you, and they will go the same route that you go into eternity. Your influence, no man lives unto himself. No man dies unto himself. Your influence can take good people and make it bad or take bad people and make them good. But your influence is very, very important. It's that steady influence that impacts us. We all cast a shadow. That shadow can be one of healing or it can be a shadow of devastation, addiction, and bondage. I'm saying to you today, when you think about the kind of influence that men in the Bible and women in the Bible had, that still speaks today. I think about the influence of Abraham that birthed three major, major religions in the world today, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, all look back to Abraham as their founder. Think about the kind of influence that a man by the name of Moses had when God told him to go and set the captives free from Egypt and he brought the Ten Commandments and today that influence is still upon our lives and upon our culture. I thought about the influence of Paul when he went into the desert for three years and he spoke to no one and he sought God's face after his conversion and he only had with him in that desert the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and maybe the book of Psalms. And he studied those, but when he came out of the wilderness experience, he brought with him the book of Galatians, the book of Philippians, the book of Ephesians, the book of Colossians. And today his influence lives on. I think about young people who are so easily, easily, easily influenced. Whose influence are you following? If that young prophet had not followed the wrong influence, he would have no doubt done many more mighty things. But influence can cut off, can cut off your destiny, can destroy your calling, can stop your purpose. It matters who you hang out with. It matters who you give influence in your life. It matters who you listen to. It matters how they influence your life. The Bible said evil com company corrupts morals. If you, you can be a good person and a, and a godly person, meaning and wanting to do right, but if you allow the influence of evil into your life, it can take you the wrong way. 
Sometimes, sometimes young people, they want to, they want to influence others. I read the story of a student who uh, was in college and he did not study for his test. And it was a term paper and a test and he had to take the test and he heard the Christian, the professor was a Christian, so he never read the Bible, but he found a verse and he wrote it in the top after he did his attempt to pass the exam and he wrote these words, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. And the professor graded the pep the, the paper and of course gave him the terrible grade that he deserved and then he wrote this verse down at the bottom my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge <laughs> he was trying the young man was trying to influence but it didn't work we strive to be a good influence is what God's called us to be the Duke of Wellington said, I consider Napoleon's presence in the battlefield equal to 40,000 men. Now that's influence. The Duke of Ellington said, if I see Napoleon on the field, to me it carries the weight, the influence of 40,000 soldiers fighting instead of one man being on the field. That's how powerful his influence was on the battlefield. Joash did what was right all the days of Jehoiada the priest. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joash. One man did what was right and the influence hit the whole nation. Revelation 14 and 13 said, Blessed are they who die in the Lord. Listen, for their works do follow them. In other words, if you're a good influence on someone, your family or people. When you die, it's not over. But your good works, they follow you the same path in the place where your bones are, that spiritually speaking, their bones will be influenced to go the same direction, either to hell or to heaven, either into eternal life or eternal damnation. But the scripture is very clear. Those who die in the Lord, their works, their children, their families, there is an influence even after we're gone that they have a bend. They may, they may experiment, may, may get out, but if you've had the influence that God wanted you to have, they're gonna somehow make their way back to the exit that you made to go to heaven. Come on and clap your hands if you believe the word today. In New York City, there was a woman by the name of Mary Malone. Mary Malone worked as a cook for many wealthy families, about five or six wealthy families in New York City. And in 1907, there was a terrible disease called typhoid fever that broke out and it went from one family to another, from one community to another. And when the health department began to study it, they noticed that the one common denominator with these communities that people were dying of this disease called typhoid fever, it came as a result of that woman had been in their kitchens cooking in all of those homes. The newspapers got a hold of it and they nicknamed her Typhoid Mary. She was a walking container of deadly typhoid fever. Everywhere she went, she contaminated people and people started dying by the hundreds. She disappeared, but six years later, Typhoid struck another community and they found out sure enough that she had become an employee in a kitchen in that area and 200 deaths were attributed to Typhoid Mary. I'm preaching today that there are spiritual Typhoid Marys. That if you get around certain people, they take the courage out of you. They take the joy out of you. They take righteousness and the anointing and the call of God and doing what's right. The more you get around them, the more they influence you and contaminate you to do what is not right. I believe that there are individuals who have evil influence. And if you allow them into your life, and that's why you need to guard what you listen to, guard who you allow to have voices and influence in your life. You cannot just get around everything and everybody and think it won't influence you. It will. Jeroboam made Israel to sin 
That, faith, that, that phrase is found 20 times in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. One man, 20 times, he made Israel a whole nation to, to, to sin. His influence was to make people move into an area of sin. Parents and fathers and mothers can have evil influences on their children. An example is a man by the name of Ahazi. The Bible said he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked not in the ways of the Lord. Listen to this. But walk in the ways of his father, Abraham, uh, his father Ahab and his mother Jezebel. He had evil parents. And because he had evil parents, their influence caused him to go in the direction that he went. You cannot say, it's nobody's business how I live. I'm not making anybody do anything. But your influence is real in a person's life. The power of influence is that it lives on after we die. No man dies unto himself. No man lives unto himself. Your influence lives on. It's passed from one generation to another generation. Abraham still, even though he's been dead, he still speaks to me of faith. Moses still speaks to me of meekness. David still speaks to me of worship. Joshua still speaks to me of be of good courage. Paul still speaks to me of determination. In all of these things, I am more than a conqueror. When I think of so many who are dead and yet they still speak, the Bible said, I think of my own father. I think of the influence that his short life cast on me. And to this day, I find myself when I'm making decisions, take those decisions through the filter of the example that he lived for me and before me. I remember when I was just a child, just little things that can influence our children. But my dad was a preacher. I lived in a parsonage. We never owned a home, but we lived in the church's home. And usually they were right by the church, the, the little house. And, and, and dad, would, dad was a wonderful father. He was a fun, loving dad and a joyful man and loved having fun and eating and all of that. We had a big family. I have two sisters and two brothers. And we used to have a big time as a family. But I noticed that when the weekend would be, be getting close around Thursday or Friday and definitely all day Saturday, dad would almost take on a different mood and a different something would come upon him and he would pull himself away. And One of those little parsonages that we live in, his office was in Rocky Mount. It was in the house and it was really a closet that, that he had to put bookshelves because we didn't have any room. And and dad, dad would go in that little closet office and he would shut the door and lock the door. And we all knew he's in there seeking God. You know, I, I didn't think about it then, but I turned the TV down because the, <laughs> the family room was right here and his little office was right here. And he'd go in there and we wouldn't see him sometimes all day long. He'd come out, go to the bathroom and go back in. That'd be about it. And we'd be sitting there watching TV or having fun or throwing stuff. But we knew on Saturday, shh, He's in there. And I can remember going over to the church and he used to have prayer meetings in the church on Saturday nights and Saturday afternoons and I would sneak in the back of that little country church and I would look up over the pews because he had told us to stay out of there and he'd have the lights out and just have one up around the choir or something and he'd be walking and pacing the floor and praying, oh God. Oh, God, save. Oh, Holy Spirit, fall. Oh, God. And he'd walk back and forth. And I'd get up and just watch him. And I, I, I wanted to say something, but I knew I'd get in trouble. So I'd just watch him as a little kid. But I never dreamed how that was influencing me. To this day, I remember those moments. That's influence. The power of influence can flow from generation to generation. We need to guard our influence. Proverbs 22 and 1 said, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, more than silver, more than gold. We need to guard our influence with our family and over people's lives. It, 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 it's easier to live right. It's easier to live godly and live holy when certain people are around us. 
That's when you know your influence is mattering. I hope one of the things that's said of me when I'm gone is it was easier to love God when he was around. Your influence is contaminating every person for the good or the bad. I love that story in Exodus 32. The Bible said Moses went up on the mountain and he left Aaron in charge. And Aaron backslid. And when Moses comes back down off the mountain from hearing from God, and he looks and they're worshiping a golden calf. And he said, what happened? Aaron, I I made you the preacher over the whole congregation. What happened? How did they go from being a people consecrated to God and I go off for 40 days and come back and they're worshiping a golden calf? And this is his answer in, in 32 and verse 24 of Exodus. He said, he said, I took up an offering. They gave me the gold. I dumped the gold into the fire. And then he uses these words and out came the calf. He's totally taking the fact that he had him. If there was a calf that came out of that fire, I promise you he didn't grow horns on his own. I promise you he didn't grow legs and a tail. I promise you he didn't look like a calf. It was the fact that Aaron was molding and shaping and influencing. Hello? You can say, I I didn't ask them to follow me. I didn't ask them to party like me. But between what they were and what they are is you. And you influence those habits. And you influence those ideas. And you influence those friends. And you influence those children. And one day you're going to stand before God. And he's going to say, what did you do with the influence I gave you? That's why I don't do everything I can do. Paul said, all things, all things are, are, are lawful for me. But there's some things I don't do because I realize that in the same place my bones go, other people, because of my influence, they will go. And even though I might could handle it, I'm not going to do it because they may go down the wrong road. If you want to serve, if you won't serve God for any other reason, if you won't serve God for your own soul, why don't you think about those you love and who follow your influence. There are bright, shiny eyed kids looking at you, grandpa, mom, dad. There's bright, shiny eyes of kids watching you. Now, if you haven't been insulted, you're going to be now. It's a sobering question. Would your kids have a better chance of being saved if you were not their parents? Would your kids have a better chance of being saved if you were not their grandparents? If you want to serve God for yourself and you won't serve God for yourself, you made up your mind, you ought to do it for your babies. For in the same grave where your bones lie, lies the bones of the ones you lead astray with your influence. I'm saying to you today that Achan led his family into the same grave of destruction. I have in my office the commentaries of a man by the name of Matthew Henry. In my generation of preachers, I suppose Matthew Henry's commentaries are the ones that most preachers for the last 50 years have gone to. And I actually received those commentaries from my father as an inheritance. When he died, I was given the Matthew Henry commentaries that were in my father's office. And I've used them many, many times. Let me tell you about Matthew Henry. He was an attorney in Chicago. And he was a alcoholic. He was very wealthy, very successful, but he could not control his drinking and he was an alcoholic. And he tells the story, this man who went from being an attorney who was extremely wealthy to an absolute Bible scholar. How did it happen? What kind of transformation? Here's the turning point. He lived in Chicago downtown and he was going to his prestigious law office and every day on his way, He would stop by a bar and he would get him a a drink or two for the road. And then he would go on to his office and carry on the rest of the day and do the same thing on his way home. 
He said one morning as he got up to leave, he walked outside and there was fresh snow that was falling, just lightly grazing the sidewalk. And he walked to work like he did every morning, stopped by the bar, started to open the door to the bar, and he turned around, he heard a sound, and he saw his 10-year-old son. And he said his 10-year-old son was taking his little feet and stepping into the big footprints that were imprinted in that light, freshly fallen snow. And his boy was stepping right into his big footprints. And he said, suddenly conviction smote his heart when he realized the footprints that I am leaving for my son are leading him right to the same destruction that I'm experiencing in my own life. He said he stopped, closed the door to the bar, ran and picked that boy up, ran home, went down to the basement of his home, fell to his knees and cried out, oh God, save me. And he was gloriously, gloriously saved. God, I want my footprints that I leave behind for the next generation in the same grave that my bones go. I want my influence to make sure that I, 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 I cause my children to have a clear path to eternity and life and life everlasting through Jesus Christ. It's all that matters. The money doesn't matter. The inheritance of house and car, it does not matter. You better use the influence you have now to leave them in the right path. Somebody is following you. In the terrible epitaph of Bethel, is the prophet said, here lies the bones. Here lies the bones of an old dead shell of a prophet. But the greater tragedy is in the same ground, in the same gravestone. Here lies the bones of a young man of God that was led astray by the influence of that man who once had a touch of God, but he backslid and he led that new generation the wrong way. The spiritual epitaph in this room today will be here lies the bones of a husband that would not serve the Lord. Here lies the bones of a wife that would not serve the Lord. When some of you die, it'll be here lies the, 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 the bones of a teenager even who would not serve the Lord. But the greater tragedy is in the same place because everyone has influence will be bones of others who wanted to serve the Lord. Children who wanted to go to church. Loved ones who would have followed the path to life and eternal, and eternal forgiveness and grace in heaven. They would have gone that direction, but you didn't lead them. I know this is a heavy message today, but we're not playing games when we assemble in this room. The truth is, every one of us have a tremendous influence, and we're determining by our footprints and by the legacy that we leave behind. Our influence is speaking even after we are dead. Here lies the bones of parents. They live for the world. They would not serve the Lord, but the greater tragedy is in that same grave. Here lies children, precious children who would have been in church, who would have served the Lord, who wouldn't have went into a lifestyle of addiction. Somebody needs to change your influence for good. Here lies the bones of those you led into indifference, coldness, lukewarmness. I tell you, this message kind of rocked me this week as I searched my heart and I said, Lord, I want to leave such an influence for your glory. I want my life to matter. I want pastoring free chapel to matter. I don't want people just to come and hear a sermon and enjoy it. But I want something beyond my sermons and my words. I want a supernatural influence that comes on people that makes them want to be more like Jesus. That makes us want to pray. That makes us want to read that book. 
that makes us want to serve in the kingdom, that makes us want to worship, that makes us want to give of our resources to proclaim the name of Jesus around the world. One day I'm going to die. But I'm not, going to take, I'm not going down in a grave of lukewarmness and mediocrity. I'm going to go down on fire with fire in my bones. And if you're following me in Jesus' name, you're going to have that fire too. Come on. Clap your hands and say, Lord, make me a great influence for you. Stand to your feet. The influence of this church is is enormous and it's growing and it's going into places that we never dreamed let's stay real still and real quiet folks during this time your influence right now can break conviction off of somebody because you want to get to the buffet wow that's just how it is I'm sorry I'm preaching my heart out to get to this point and some old casual Christian gets up It's not right. Say amen. I don't care. Say amen. It's the truth. We don't do that around here. We honor Jesus. Shut the doors. This is not a game. The influence of this ministry is growing, reaching, expanding. We have got to be full of Jesus. I want our influence not just to be of a big something or another. I want it to be of a godly, of a pure. They took note of them. They had been with the Lord. How many of you want to be that kind of good influence in the life of your family, the life of your friends, on your job, in the community? Every head bowed, every eye closed. I feel strong today. Strong conviction for people who are backslid, running from God. The truth is your footsteps are going in the wrong direction and here lies the bones. If you were to go into eternity today, where would your influence lead those who are behind you? In the same place you go, it's possible your influence will lead them, good or evil. Many of you young people, you don't understand that if you're strong in the Lord, you have influence that way. And if you're not, then you're just encouraging others. And, 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 and sin, the enemy uses our influence every way he can. Today, this is a day to clean your life up by the blood of the cross and say, Jesus, help me to influence for good and not evil. This is your moment. This is your altar call. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Pastor, pray for me today. I know I'm not leading. I know I'm not influencing like I ought to be. And I'm ready today to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I'm going to have an encounter like Matthew Henry had. I'm ready today to lead my family and people who I have influence with. I want to lead them to Jesus. I want to lead them to life. Pray for me. If that's you and you don't know you're right with God and you want to get right with God, Pastor, pray for me. Raise your hand high as you can get it right where you're standing. I want to see it. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Raise it high and unashamed all the way up, all the way to the back, wherever you are at every campus. Every one of you that raised your hand, look at me just a moment. Do something for me. Step out of your seat this very moment, wherever you are, no matter how far the distance, get out of your seat and come walk and stand right down here. We're going to pray a prayer. I feel like God today is going to do a glorious. Just keep it right where you had it. Come on. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. There's many more. There's many more. There's many more at every campus. Get out of your seat. Get out of your seat. Get out of your seat. Beautiful. 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 Come on. Come on. Come on. There may be whole families. There may be dads, husbands, wives, teenagers, college students. You raised your hand. Just slip out of that seat and say, you know what? I'm not going to let my influence be used for evil. 
I'm not going to let what I was put on this earth to do just destroy people's lives. I just believe God can use me for his good and for his glory. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. Come on. Keep clapping. Keep clapping like chains are breaking. Keep, keep clapping like eternity is at stake right here, right now, because it is. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I've known very keenly aware I have been while I preach that I am plucking some people out of the fire. I'm plucking entire generations out of the curse and the lineage of addiction and bondage. And by the blood of Jesus Christ, you're going to leave here today a powerful, good, godly influence for the kingdom. Come on. Come on. Come on. This is beautiful. It's never too late for a miracle. And God brought you to this service today. Let's pray this prayer. Everybody out loud, say these words. Lord Jesus, I humbly come and surrender my life completely to you. Save me. Wash me. Cleanse me. And forgive me. Today, by the blood of the cross, I am a new creation. I am born again. And I receive the precious grace of God that sets me free and gives me power to be a godly influence, a good influence in Jesus' name. Lord, I ask you to now use me for good the way the enemy used me for evil. Let me influence for good the way that the devil used me for evil. Now throw your hands up and thank him for just a moment. Lord, I just pray in the name of Jesus for every person who prayed that prayer. May they feel freedom. May they be filled with the Holy Spirit. May they leave here today with a transformed heart. In Jesus' precious name. How many of you receive that? How many of you receive this word today? Do you receive it? Turn to somebody and say, these bones are going to be a good influence in your life. If you don't know how to praise, my influence is going to praise for you. I'll teach you how to walk. I'll teach you how to live for God. I'll teach you how to serve the Lord. Let's give the Lord another great praise. I just feel like we ought to praise Him a minute. And I close with this. All of you who prayed this prayer, there's something called next steps. And you got to do it. Because what just happened is you got born again. And to complete, and I know you're completely forgiven, but to go to the next place that God wants to take you, you just add water. You need to be baptized. Jesus commanded it. And here's why that's important to this sermon. When we take you under the water, and I'll do it. When I take you under the water, the old bones are being, and the old influence is being buried. And when I bring you up out of the water, the new bones that are full of he said his words like fire in my bones. You come up with new influence, good influence, and everything's changed. You need to get signed up for next steps. And they're going to tell you how to do that. And in three weeks, it'll change your life. I'm telling you, you've made a powerful step today and you're forgiven and your name is in heaven. But now go on with the Lord and let your influence grow. Because the more you know about Jesus, the greater your influence will grow. And to God be the glory for that. Are you ready for the blessing? Everybody right now, just stretch your hand this way and receive the blessing. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine on you. Be gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And Lord, forgive the preacher for being mean to people who left early today. In Jesus, I'm already under conviction. I'll go home and lay in the bed at night and say, why was I so mean? Maybe they had to go to the bathroom real bad. Let's all give them a little bit of grace. Maybe they had all kinds of issues. Amen. 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 But they never do that at the movies. That's what gets me. They never do that at the movies. It's always in the church. 
sit through a three-hour movie of Mission Impossible, but can't, can't, uh, anyhow, see, I'm doing it again. Just leave while things are good. Get out, get out. I love you, I love you. God bless you. Grace, we all need grace. <laughs> Praise God. You want, as I said earlier, that you can stay connected with what's taking place in the life of this church and through this ministry uh, by checking out Pastor Jensen's blog at jensenfranklin.org, or you can follow him on any one of these social media outlets on Facebook and Instagram. And as we talked about in the beginning of service, he was one of 80 delegates that was personally selected to be a part of an event at the State Department, recognizing those who had been persecuted around the world because of religious freedom. And so we want you to know that when Pastor Jensen is a part of those events, the part of those, uh, part of those efforts, you are there just as much a part in partnering with us and seeing God continue to move, not only through the United States, but most, impo most importantly, throughout the world. So stay connected with us all throughout what God is doing in the life of this ministry. But also for the ladies out there, don't, re don't forget about divine conference taking place uh, in the middle of September right here at our Gainesville campus or in our Orange County campus just a few short weeks later. More information on that is at divineconference.org. But if you haven't registered, do that today. But we love you so much. We're thrilled that you joined us here today for another service at Free Chapel, and we'll see you next Sunday morning.